Lita is the Associate Professor of Fire Science and Forest Conservation and also the co-director of the Conserved Forest Ecosystem Outreach and Research Cooperative at University of Florida School of Forest Resources and Conservation. She's actively engaged in promoting support and the increasing understanding of fire's role in the maintenance of forests through her activities as a Florida Certified Prescribed Burden Manager on the Board of Directors of the Association for Fire Ecology and as the Associate Editor of Fire Ecology. So Lita, thank you so much for coming and the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> this one is not actually on. Um, we go. I'm going to project. <clears throat> Excuse me. With your phone on? Okay. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me okay if I stop coughing long enough? No? Okay. Just raise your hand at any point if I stop projecting well enough for you to hear me. Um, <clears throat> I'm always happy to be here. It's always a, a, a pleasure and, and even more so a privilege to be at Tall Timbers, the birthplace of fire ecology. Um, the first thing I ever heard about the South coming from California about a decade ago in regards to fire was all about tall timbers. So um, it's, it's always definitely an honor to be here and to be talking with all of you today. I have a couple of goals for what i um, trying to do with this presentation. And fortunate I have a little bit extra time so I can go a little bit more slowly on some of the graphs and slides that I'll be sharing with you. In general, though, um, if I do go through things a little too quickly, there are copies of a lot of the material that I'm going to be talking about today in a paper a publication that we have, and there are copies of that up front. It's also available online, open access. So everything that I'll be saying is stuff that you will all have access to um, in a variety of different forms throughout the summit. So I'm going to talk about some recent research that we've been engaged in, um, looking at who, what, where, when, and why <coughs> of prescribed burning in the South, and also addressing some of the questions about why we're not doing more, or what are some of the challenges that need to be overcome in order to do more prescribed burning. And then I'll briefly mention some upcoming research to support our program effectiveness. So as many of you are probably aware, um, our fire-prone, fire-adapted, and lightning-ignited ecosystems mean that we have a lot of wildfire. So we don't only have a lot of prescribed fire, but a lot of wildfire. And if you look at some statistics, and these are for public lands from the National Interagency Fire Center, what this indicates is, of course, that uh, we have the highest number of wildfires and the highest number of acres if you take out Alaska. And of course, Alaska's got about 3 million to 5 million acres already burned in this year. But the 10-year average shows that you know, these are ecosystems that are made to burn. These are things that you are all familiar with. But unlike any of the other regions across the country, even just looking at public lands, um, we burn more and more acres and more fires than we do have in wildfires. And that's something that's really different from the rest of the country and something that we can be proud of. It's not only the public who is responsible for this, of course. Um, we already heard about the amount of ownership that's private, 87% roughly. So obviously the private landowners are contributing significantly to the use of prescribed fire in the region. And there's a number of different reasons that they're doing this. Um, restoration, wildlife habitat, even controlling competition on some commercial lands, although that's not as much of an emphasized um, goal. And we have a lot of partnerships that are responsible for making sure that these things are accomplished. So a lot of these public-private partnerships are really critical and essential for achieving prescribed burns in the region. So in 2012, Probably some of you are familiar with this report, um, the National Prescribed Fire Use Survey report that the state foresters and prescribed fire councils put together showed that uh, we have about, if you add it all together for the southern region, about 8 million acres that are burned on average annually. But that takes into consideration both the private and the public, but if you put those together, it still doesn't actually meet our fire restoration goals. A very uh, conservative estimate of what fire return intervals might look like across the region would suggest that our entire region is characterized by understory fires from 0 to 10 years. And as Lane mentioned, the frequency of a lot of these ecosystems is much, much higher than that. But if you think about the entire region being characterized 
by at least a 10 year interval. Then let's do this quiz together. So I'm, I'm cutting class today. I teach a summer class. And so I'm cutting class today. I'm going to bring some of the classroom work to you guys instead. So let's think about the southern region. If we consider pre-settlement times of 354 million acres on average um, would be about the amount of forest that a lot of people approximate was here prior to settlement. So how many acres would we have to burn to maintain a 10-year fire return interval or FRI across the region? All right, you guys are much faster than my students. 35.4 million acres, right? So we're looking at about 200 million acres of forest today, and as you just saw, we're burning about 8 million acres. So what's our deficit? 12 million more acres, all right? And that's just to maintain a 10-year fire return interval. So of course, this includes forest plantations, um, and you'll see from some of the data that I'll present that those are some of the, the places, especially commercial forestry, where fire is being used less than in other private lands. But it's certainly um, a goal that, that we can all identify and something that we can work together towards achieving. So managers and ecologists agree that we probably need more fire, but how do we get to that point? Before we can even address how we get to that point, um, there are some things that we still don't know too much about as far as the foundation, the starting point of where we're going. So who is actually burning what? Where is that burning occurring? when and why, and what are some of the reasons why burning is not occurring? And are landowners able to meet their objectives using fire? And under what kinds of conditions? What really matters and dictates whether people are able to use prescribed fire? So these group, this group of questions is what's really inspired a lot of the research that I've done during my time here. And what I'm gonna focus on today is that starting point. Who's burning what, where, when, why, and some, some points about why not. So like I mentioned, I'm drawing from some recent publications, and we also have some upcoming research as well. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but these um, papers are both available for you. I mentioned the first one, and the other is uh, problems and needs for restorationists of longleaf pine ecosystems. So that's really focused on longleaf pine specifically, and some of this analysis is as well. So we decided to conduct a survey um, to try to get a regional assessment of this who, what, where, when, and why of prescribed burning. And we used the Southern Fire Exchange Listserv, which at that time had over 2,000 members on it. We conducted the survey in the fall and winter of 2012. We used um, standard so social science techniques. There were 25 total questions, and we had 523 respondents. So this is the biggest study that has ever been done on regional prescribed burning, 39% response rate, which is, is quite high for this kind of study. We were able to get information from 11 states and 14 different affiliations or employers. And 80% were able to finish all questions. Um, how many of you remember this survey or took this survey? It was online? Okay, great. Well, I'm hoping that some of the, the things that I've quoted in here could be attributed to some of you in the audience. We got a tremendous amount of great, great information. And I think one of the most <clears throat> impressive things that we found was that the cumulative years of fire experience among respondents was um, more than we ever could have expected. Does anybody want to take a guess as to how many cumulative years of fire experience was represent, were represented by this survey group? 5,000. Okay. 12,000. 12,000, wow. 20 plus years. Okay. You had it right yeah. almost on the head, 5,875 years. So, the, the respondents on average had 14 years of fire experience. So we're talking about people who really, really know what they're talking about. Okay, so who were the respondents? Um, <clears throat> most of the respondents worked in longleaf pine, slash pine, loblolly pine, or shortleaf pine ecosystems. <coughs> and a lot of them were from either Florida, North Carolina, or Georgia. And you can see that Florida was representing about 36% of the respondents. But we had a pretty wide distribution of affiliations. If you sum up all of the different state, county, and local respondents, that was 35%. Federal respondents, 27%. Private, 23 And NGOs of 
So we got a pretty good representation across the wide range of different affiliations that our prescribed burning community is associated with. We look at private landowners specifically, um, the demographics are a little bit different. We had more representation from North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Alabama, um, above some of the other states. And most of them describe themselves either as a natural resource manager or other. So that would be things like a, a forester. So there are a lot of write-ins answers for that. So <clears throat> what are they doing? If we look at the number of acres managed by individual responses over the acres burned, that gives us a percent of acres burned annually. And the reason that we look at it this way is because this survey was based on individual responses. So each person was representing what they are doing on their land. That means that if they're working on the same piece of land that somebody else is working on, they're counting the same number of acres. So we can't actually ascertain the total number of acres that are being burned using this method. Instead, what we can ascertain is the percentage of the acres that they are responsible for managing, which they prescribe for. Does that make sense to everybody? <clears throat> so really impressively, um, to me, private contractors are burning even more than NGOs or state forestry in terms of percentage of acres managed. Private non-commercial landowners burning right about the same as state forestry industries, uh, excuse me, um, agencies. And at the very bottom, we have private commercial, which is um, something that many of you might expect. So if we break this down a little bit more with regards to changes in prescribed fire use over time, what private landowners reported in the private contractor category is that within either the last 10 years or the last five years, there was an increase. So the majority reported an increase in prescribed fire use over time. Private non-commercial landowners reported an increase in the last 10 years and then either remain the same, decreased, and much less of an increase in the last five years. <clears throat> and then private commercial landowners, majority reported a decrease in the last 10 years, a little bit less of a decrease in the last five years, but either a decrease or remain the same, and a much smaller increase in prescribed burning in the last five to 10 years. And this is probably not a surprise to most of you in the audience. But I think that if we're thinking about the areas in which um, we can effectively communicate potential use and benefits of prescribed fire on private lands, I think it's really important to take into consideration um, this landowner category because it's a really, really big one. So many of you are from other states. Um, raise your hand if your state is not represented here. Okay. And where, where are you from? South Carolina. South Carolina, okay. Um, sorry about that. I thought I would catch everybody. South Carolina was actually very similar to North Carolina. So if we look at that increased in yellow, decrease in blue, remain the same in red, or don't know, first thing you'll notice is that nobody thinks they don't know in Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> You'll also notice that the decreases are, are biggest, or the most people reported decreases in Mississippi in comparison to the others. And this is in the last 10 years. But in general, if you look at all of these together, over 55% reported increases in the last 10 years. And we see that change again that you saw with the private landowners in the last five years. Um, those increases have attenuated, even in those places where increases are still being reported. So gains that have been made over 10 years are considered to be bigger than gains that have been made over the last five years. And you can also see that in um, Mississippi, the amount of uh, people who reported that there was decreased use in prescribed fires is quite high. And that's uh, roughly split in thirds for Mississippi. And that went up in all categories as well for the other states. So something's happening in the last five years. So as to the question of where people are doing what they're doing. So we have um, some sense of what's going on with broad, um, kind of large scale course evaluation of where prescribed burns are happening 
And these are usually based on state records, permitting records, et cetera. So you can see across the southern region that we have um, some variability all the way from over a million acres to about 1,000 to 50,000 acres. But if you look more specifically at um, what's being done in particular places, there's really a lot of information that can be gleaned from that. Um, one of the challenges that we have been confronted with and that has um, set us back a little bit is the challenge of actually finding and pinpointing where burns are happening. So, of course, as most of you know, all of the states have different ways of keeping records um, of permitting. And in the state of Florida, I'm just using this as an example because the Florida Forest Service has been kind enough to share with us um, this data, the smallest order of magnitude in terms of spatial resolution is a section. And that's all we know about where a prescribed burn happens is somewhere within that 640 acres there was a prescribed burn. So if we're trying to ascertain who's burning what, where, why, and what kind of ecosystem they're burning, um, it's a very, very big challenge because we don't know exactly where within that section they're burning. So we can make some generalizations and do some uh, spatial analysis to try to, to try to kind of pull that data out of a variety of different data sets. And, and that's what we've started to do. So we're looking in this case, um, when we started to do this analysis, we recognized that there were some pretty big differences between easements and public and private land. So these are conservation easements. And we saw that these started to, to come out as being really frequently burned areas. Um, so we actually put it in a separate category. So this is just an example of what we've started to do working with the gigantic data set with over 300,000 lines of, of information from the Florida Forest Service. Um, but this kind of analysis is something that could be done regionally and I think could yield a lot of really important and useful information about what's happening on our lands. So um, recently, Florida has been um, declared to be home of 51% of the known longleaf pine ecosystems. So we're going to kind of focus on those longleaf pine ecosystems, also because these longleaf pine polygons have just recently been um, consolidated and verified by the Florida Forest Service and the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. Um, so this is kind of data that's fresh off the press. So if we're looking within those ecosystems, so we've got acres with longleaf pine, you see over a million in public, 63,000 in, in easement, and over 800,000 in private. And we've got acres with longleaf pine that are burned, and this is on an annual basis. So that average prescribed burn count per year is 225 for private, 518 for public, and 67 for easement. An average percent of what's being burned is 29% for easement, and that's above both for public and for private. So that was one of the reasons we thought it'd be important to kind of pull this out spatially and see if we are seeing any trends. So those easements were really, it's representative of a public-private partnership. It seems like those are really important places for a lot of prescribed burning um, to be accomplished. So our first uh, go at looking at this, and, and this is work that's being led by one of our uh, University of Florida PhD students, Scott Rothberg, um, shows, for example, around Tallahassee, we've got public lands in blue. And I apologize that this isn't coming out too well on the screen. Um, public lands in blue, the lighter colors are for prescribed burn frequencies of one to two, and, uh, to, two to three per year per parcel. So these are for long leaf, for only long leaf areas, how frequently they're being burned. So um, anybody tell me what this land area is down here? Forest. Yeah, so that's the Apalachicola National Forest. So not a surprise that there is a lot of uh, fire being used in those longleaf pine ecosystems on a frequent basis, between one and, and three burns per year per parcel. Um, and these parcels, again, we can't pinpoint exactly where it is, but we know that those polygons are overlapping places where prescribed burn authorizations were um, were awarded. Um, if we go into a little bit more detail up here, um, so green is the private and red is the easement. And I just kind of want to show you spatially, you can see that that relationship between the easement and the private lands um, looks to be significant. A lot of the areas where you have darker colored green, which means more frequent prescribed fires being used, are close to, are close to easements. 
um, some of those areas that are kind of floating off and by themselves have a little bit less prescribed fire that's being used. So we're looking into some of the details of these spatial relationships and we think that they could be really significant. Um, if we go into a little bit more detail, uh, the first thing you'll notice is that for some reason, uh, tall timbers is classified as public land, which it isn't. Um, but you can see that partnership, the sign of the partnership between private lands and easements and how important that is and also how important proximity to, to areas like tall timbers are. So again, that really dark color is representative of very frequent fire use in all these pine ecosystems. Hey, Lita, you, you had a statement earlier about easements that now that you're showing this, it confused me. But you said it's a public-private partnership. And in most cases, these easements are a private-private partnership. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I misspoke. Okay. So there's a wide variety of different types of easements. Um, probably every one of them is different from the next. So either private, private, or private, public. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Um, looking at the Osceola area, you can see that that kind of trend is also being indicated here. Um, so we've got some really important partnerships that are going on. Okay, so we've gone through the who and the what. Now why? So if you look at all of the respondents and the priorities that were identified by all 523 respondents, our number one priority is fuels reduction followed by wildlife habitat and restoration. And of course, some of these others are also important. But if we look specifically at private landowners, you can see that the private contractors who are shown in red um, are focusing on the importance of fuels reduction aspect and attributes of prescribed fire, as well as the private non-commercial landowner in terms of top priorities. And as you might expect, private commercial landowners are thinking about um, controlling competition as one of the primary um, reasons that they're doing prescribed fire. So we're, we're looking at an audience that has different motivations for using prescribed fire. And so I think that's important to take into consideration with regards to the type of messaging that we use to approach these different landowner types. All of them identified wildlife habitat as being really important as, as far as an objective for prescribed burning. So getting into some of the um, anecdotes, um, opinions from private landowners. So a private contractor from Florida said, it's the most effective fuel and habitat management tool available. Private non-commercial landowner said it's least expensive and has the highest returns. So clearly um, the financial aspect of using prescribed fire is important to this type of landowner. Another private non-commercial landowner in Georgia talks about um, prescribed fire being essential to meeting restoration goals, especially long leaf pine restoration goals. Private non-commercial in South Carolina landowner suggested that log lolly pine stands can be managed using fire. It can control vegetation, so here's that control of competition that we saw, and also reduce fuels. So in many of these cases, um, that fuels reduction attribute of prescribed burning is really important. So we continue to ask, what are the actual uh, what are the actual beliefs about what fires do in terms of fuels reduction and wildfire risk reduction. And if we look at our private sector respondents in four of the dominant ecosystems that were represented, we can look at how wildfire ignitions, how, how this um, response group suggested that wildfire ignitions were controlled depending on the number of years since the last fire. So if a fire were to occur in an area that had been burned one to two years previously, how effective was that in reducing wildfire emissions? So you can see that that's, it's different for different ecosystems. So that probably is going to play a role as far as what's important to those private landowners, the type of ecosystems that they're working in, and how much they believe that fuels reduction is one of the main goals and one of the main attributes of using prescribed fire effectively in those systems. But it drops off pretty significantly once you get into um, the three to four year range. Now, it's not just ignition for that matter, of course. Um, wildfire behavior is 
a very important attribute, and that's going to have some significant repercussions on the cost of suppression and the use of suppression resources following a fire which is ignited. So here you can see that uh, most of the landowners concur that there's a longer term effect in regards to fire behavior than there is with regards to fire ignition. So there's an important distinction there. Um, that the effects are not necessarily important with regards to just keeping fire out. Um, we know that we're going to have ample ignitions, but making fire either more manageable or not destructive when it doesn't occur, when wildfires do occur. So that's the kind of thing that, that we're seeing represented in this data. So some opinions on fire effects on wildfire, um, they kind of all center on like a sort of it depends response. So there are a lot of nuances here that um, that are captured in some comments that we had, and, and these things are actually captured in a lot of the research that we've done too, where we're looking at a remote sensing assessment of burn severity, one fire versus the next. And we see that in some areas, uh, depending on what type of vegetation is burning, depending on the climate, that you can get a high severity fire one right after the other. And then three years later, another one if you're in an El Nino, La Nina cycle. So we've got some um, research that supports that there, there are a lot of nuances and um, maybe exceptions to the assumption that there's a direct linear relationship between wildfires and prescribed fires. And we saw that captured in um, some of the, the comments and responses that we've received from our respondents. So a wildlife biologist from Alabama said, if you increase the amount of available fine fuels, you have a more receptive fuel bed to outside ignition. So there again, that's reflected in that data that we saw that showed that one to two years is sort of the, the window in which a prescribed burn can be effective in potentially reducing wildfire emissions. So the importance of frequent fire is really emphasized there. In extreme weather years, um, such as 2011, I'm not sure prescribed fire is effective. Several incident management teams were mobilized to suppress fires that occurred in a one to three year rut. They spent 10 times as the amount on the suppression as they did on fuels treatment in areas they recently burned. In this case, prescribed fire and lots of it didn't reduce wildfire. In fact, it likely increased it because of the increased fine fuel loads. So the, the sort of breadth and depth of experience that, that our respondents have had with the relationship between prescribed fire and wildfire is something that is um, starting to become evident in some of the research that we've been doing. But I think that it's important to take into consideration that um, it might not be so much an order of magnitude difference, but the effects on costs of suppression, the duration of fire events, number of personnel required and equipment needed might be the, the really important drive home message. So we asked <clears throat> if a fire occurs in an area that has been recently I'm sorry, that meets the fire return interval, so the rotation interval, that is the objective of the landowner, or if it exceeds that fire return interval. So the yellow color is if that fire return interval is being met. So that means if they identified that they are managing a longleaf pine ecosystem, their desired fire return interval is two years, and that's being maintained, the question then is what happens to suppression resources if a wildfire occurs in that area? So we were trying to, to put those two pieces together and understand what that relationship is. Um, and you can see these kind of look pretty much like they're all the same. But there's a little bit of um, duration of wildfire event and cost of suppression that more respondents reported that there was a major decrease in those things. Um, but importantly, and something that sort of surprised us, <clears throat> is that more people didn't report that there was a major decrease in those things, in cost of suppression, equipment needed, number of personnel required, and duration of fire event. So we expected that the majority would respond that there was a major decrease in all of those things, since fuels reduction is the goal. Um, but I think because of some of these nuances, the fact that we are actually perpetuating flammable ecosystems, which is appropriate given our fire-adapted history. Um, but you can see that that didn't, didn't necessarily show up in the way that we might have expected. So how about why not? Why are some folks challenged in being able to use prescribed fire as much as they would like to? So this is looking at the overall respondents and the top three impediments by landowner. 
So you can see that a lot of the federal agencies reported that budget was one of the major limiting factors. So number one means that it's the highest priority impediment. I'm, I'm sorry, it's the strongest impediment. Number two, least less strong, and number three, least strong. And if you look at the private landowners, number one, liability. Probably not a surprise to anyone here. Um, number two, regulations, and number three, staffing. And in this question, um, this was a, a question that didn't include weather factors. So we were really interested in sort of the more institutional impediments to prescribe rate. So again, that liability um, <clears throat> is really coming out in the private landowner sector and not so much identified as being important in the other sectors. So you see staffing and budget being more important in state and federal agencies. If we look at another source of data, which is the prescribed fire report from 2012, um, liability also ranks really high in the southeast. So the light blue color here is the southeast, and that's compared to national data. So we've got liability, capacity, which might be akin to staffing or personnel, um, and then, of course, the air quality and weather factors. So we broke down our analysis into those three different uh, private landowner types. And you can see that in the private non-commercial landowner, staffing is more of a concern. In the private commercial and the private contractor, that's where you see the liabilities uh, concerns come out there. So some really different ideas as to what things are limiting given the different private landowner types. So again, a reason to kind of consider these different um, audiences when constructing a message for prescribed burning. So some opinions that support this data um, from private landowners, it's getting harder and harder to burn because of urban migration. So we've got wildland urban interface. This person kind of captured it all. And raise your hand if you're one of the people who's quoted on any of these slides, please. <laughs> any yet? Anybody recognize their work yet? Um, educating the public to the value of prescribed burns would help somewhat. The cost of burns is out of reach for most mid-sized landowners averaging almost $25 an acre. So even what we would consider to be a relatively low cost in comparison to something like herbicide use or mechanical treatments, still that might be out of reach for mid-sized landowners. <coughs> Educating small and mid-sized landowners of state programs to assist in cost would also help. And that's something that I think um, Reggie is going to talk about after I talk. <coughs> the private contractor from South Carolina said that the use is very limited because of profitability and liability. So cost and liability, again, coming up. Another person suggested that the most cost-effective tool in our toolbox, even if it is expensive and out of reach for some, um, unfortunately, lack of public acceptance has diminished use. So a private commercial landowner in Louisiana had that perspective. So depending on where and what kind of private landowner is, is um, representing their experience, um, we have kind of a, a wide array of different concerns that are affecting the ability to use prescribed burning. We also saw some differences across the states, and these were also kind of surprising to us. So in Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, and South Carolina, all of those states identified liability as the top impediment to burning. Despite each state having certified prescribed burn manager programs, which are linked to state laws that often that limit, at least to some extent, um, liability. So the question that um, comes to mind is for these private landowners, is it the fear of being held liable for damages if the fire escapes, or if there's a smoke issue, or is it the cost of liability insurance? So liability means different things to different people, and I think if that's a top impediment to prescribe burning on private lands, um, it would help us to understand what that really means to different types of private landowners. What aspect of liability are, are they talking about? And if they're doing a risk assessment, how is that risk being measured? Is it being measured in relation to the potential of wildfire occurrence? Um, is it being measured in relation to how well prescribed burned areas are, or how more effective suppression resources are? when burning areas 
that are already prescribed burn or when wildfire occurs in areas that are prescribed burn. So I think that there are a lot of questions here that, um, that beg discussion. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about what you think Absolutely with you. I find it puzzling as well. Unfortunately, I, I don't have data on that. Um, you know, we, we have some of these reflections from landowners that we have in, in kind of anecdotal responses, but we haven't gone forward with a continued assessment of determining what that means to different people. Um, in my personal experience, it's, it's really different depending on the private landowner you ask. Um, some will say that they're afraid of being sued by their neighbor. They won't be able to pay for costs if, uh, if the fire escapes. Some are afraid of um, smoke on roadways. Some are afraid of, uh, I don't know what else, but you know, it, it seems like it's different for every different landowner, well, um, in my experience. It's, and it, and it's, it's certainly- It's obvious, but it's a, it's a really, really different if the, the communication task is to educate the landowners about the liability Protections they are, they have to they may not appreciate mm -hmm. versus some other methods. And so, sure. Yeah, so you're. Kind of yeah, I think that's great. And that, that would be a great thing to follow up on um, in the discussions because during the next two days. Yeah, you know, we need to work on further limits. Right. So yeah, that's the question of awareness. Um, how much awareness is there of the existing liability protection? Yep. Can you repeat? I can't repeat the questions. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. The questions at the end. That's fine. Okay. No. I'm just saying, can you repeat the questions so our remote folks can hear? Is it microphones? Will do. Thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> Okay, good stuff to, uh, to keep talking about in the next couple of days. So given these challenges, um, are private landowners able to meet some of their fire return interval objectives? So this was uh, another one of the many things that we attempted to evaluate using this data. So if we talk about um, Longleaf Sandhill, um, we're talking about target fire return interval versus actual fire return interval. The majority target a one to two year interval, and only about 28% meet that one to two year target. 56% meet a three to four year target. <coughs> so if we look at longleaf slash pine flatwoods, majority again targeting one to two year interval, and 33% meeting the one to two year target roughly the same 53% meeting a three to four year target. And finally, in longleaf slash pine uplands, nearly all target either a one to two year or three to four year target, and about 50% meet the one to two year target, um, and 43% meeting a three to four year target. So <clears throat> again, the ecosystem that is in question, the ecosystem that's being managed, um, is certainly having an effect on, on how effectively private landowners are able to meet their target goals. <clears throat> so I mentioned that weather and smoke also rank high in the southeast, and this was well captured by the 2012 report. So that led us to think about um, whether we can make some assessments of how limiting burn windows really are. And this was kind of a back of the envelope sort of analysis, and we're working um, to kind of further refine this work. But what we did was we just took the Florida Forest Service list of, of uh, characteristics of weather that would determine non-burn days. And we took all of those characteristics and we applied them to about 10 years worth of weather data for the entire state of Florida. 
And we focused on areas that were frequently prescribed burns, so the, the top 10 counties in terms of burn permit authorization in Florida. <clears throat> so these are some of the characteristics that we used to evaluate and remove days that were absolutely non-burn days. So for example, days where KBDI was over 500 degrees and temperature was over 95 degrees. And you can see there are different combinations here. So these are the burn days that are acceptable um, according to those Florida Forest Service standards. We got rid of red flag days, days with precipitation, any duplicate days and major holidays, assuming that people won't have the opportunity to burn on major holidays. Greg? Um, <clears throat> what red flag criteria were you using? Has it changed during the last 10 years? The current red flag or so, back? So we, in, in a sense, we use both. So um, because we use the relative humidity of 28% as a limiting factor, we captured that change. We used red, we excluded red flag days that were actually determined by the National Weather Service to be red flag days for any given location. So that was using the federal standards. Well, I just, I know that there was data that showed that in Florida, mm -hmm. um, most red flag days until it was changed, there were burn authorization listed and people were doing a lot of burn on red flag days. Absolutely, yeah, and we found the same thing. Okay. Yep. Um, the next stage of our analysis is going to look at how much those red flag criteria affect public versus private landowners. Um, is that criteria, are these weather characteristics things that are having a bigger impact on private landowners because of their concerns about liability? So that's kind of our, our next stage of this analysis. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, on red flag days, there are a lot of people who are doing a lot of burning, especially on federal lands. So if we look at those burn window criteria um, for the top 10 counties by annual civil culture burn counts, what we found was a, a surprising number of open burn windows for each of those counties. So these are the number of days where none of those criteria are being met. So any combination of any of those criteria are not being met on these days, which means that there are days that the Florida Forest Service or the National Weather Service would consider available for burning. Now, there are, of course, a lot of other things to take into consideration. But if you just look at the burn windows, these are the results that, that we've gotten. So you can see um, a lot of burn days that are being made available. And if we look at what that would mean in terms of how many acres would need to be burned, and this is for upland conifer forests, how many acres would need to be burned to maintain a seven-year fire return interval in each of those counties? Um, you can see in Walton County, uh, 177 acres per day is what would need to be burned in that county in order to maintain a seven-year fire return interval, for example. Now, if you look at a three-year fire return interval, um, that goes up quite a bit. So for Walton County, for example, uh, 413 acres per day. Does that sound like a lot or a little? All of you. On a county level. That's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot, right? So, and that's given the surprising, to me, surprising amount of open burn windows. You know, this is, these open burn windows are more than unexpected. Um, so if we start to look at what doubling the amount of prescribed burning that's being accomplished would require, um, we get numbers like these. So I think this can sort of help us understand some of the challenges and, and maybe think about really specific ways about how to meet those challenges. <coughs> Another question that we wanted to determine was whether having an area um, that has been previously burned affects a landowner's decision-making process with regards to what weather scenarios they will burn under. So for respondents who were asked about a site burned within the last year, almost 50% of them said that they will broaden their burn windows often for an area that's been burned next to, that will be burned next to a site that was burned within the last year. So now we're trying to get at sort of the, the importance of being, the, the importance of being next to other landowners who are burning. 
And this seems to be something that's, um, that's really important. A one to two year rough, uh, over 55% said that they would often broaden their burn windows. So again, that idea of partnerships, private, 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 public, especially occurring concurrently in space um, looks to be something that's really promising in terms of increasing our capacity to take advantage of burn windows when they're open. So you can see, um, you know, just the opposite is true as you would expect for not at all. But again, frequent fire being really, really important, um, that drops off down to 20% in the red that would broaden their burn windows if they were burning next to a two to three year rough. So a pretty quick drop off in the other direction as time goes on since burn. Now, when you're thinking about burn windows and what's available for everyone to use, um, of course, smoke direction dictates like a dictator. Burn windows more than probably anything else really does. So our next stage of analysis is to look at those burn windows with regards to wind direction. Um, every single property can only burn on some wind directions. I'm not sure that there's, you know, maybe something in the interior of a federal ownership area um, they might be able to burn on any wind direction, but that's, that's also unlikely. So I think this is especially critical for private landowners and small acreage um, units that are being burned is, that, is the opportunity with regards to wind directions. So that's something we can look at too. But again, even not considering the wind directions, you saw how much it would take to be able to achieve a three-year or a seven-year fire return interval across all of those upland on forest um, systems. And again, we were only looking at upland forest systems. We weren't even looking at uh, hydric flatwoods, for example. Um, of course, a critical impediment that um, I'm not going to talk about, but Reggie will talk about after me, um, is the cost. And our assessment of people active in longleaf pine restoration suggests that that really is the highest impediment um, with regards to their capacity to use fire as a restoration tool. And interestingly, for these folks, um, at least at that point in time, uh, only 8% said that prescribed fire issues were things that were, um, that were challenging them to be able to succeed in long leaf pine restoration. Uh, so like I mentioned, um, we're going to continue work into looking at weather-related impediments, preferred wind directions. Um, and then we have the big ball of wax, which is dispersion index realities. Um, there isn't actual easily accessible uh, historical <coughs> weather data on dispersion index values. So those are things that um, we're working with climatologists in North Carolina to try to make assessments about. These are really important, of course, um, for the future, for what's going to happen when our climate changes, what's going to happen to our burn windows, and how those things are going to be related to national ambient air quality standards. We're also working on further validating prescribed fire effectiveness and meeting landowner objectives by looking at things, um, responses that are considered to be important to a lot of private landowners, like ground cover diversity restoration. So we have a project addressing that, a PhD student working on that. And then, of course, um, wildfire hazard reduction. And what we call this is uh, prescribed burn leverage. So you can think of it this way. This would be the number of wildfires burned on the y-axis and on the x-axis, the prescribed burn rate. So if those things are exactly neg negatively correlated with each other, then that would be a prescribed burn leverage of one. For every acre that is prescribed burn, there's one less acre of wildfire that occurs. So looking at some of the data for the last 10 years, or I'm sorry, for 2004 to 2013, um, for only lightning ignited wildfires in Florida, in those last 10 years, we see, we see a relationship of about 0.5 is our prescribed burn leverage. And that has a lot to do with the fact that the more we burn in a lot of cases, the more flammable our ecosystems are. And that's not necessarily a, a bad thing, um, because what we are also gaining is a better capacity to limit suppression resources and the amount of money that's invested in fighting wildfires when they occur in places where they're more easily fought. So that prescribed burn leverage, I think, is really important. Um, it's important in terms of messaging as well. Uh, leverage is really leverage in terms of policy and program support and funding. Um, 
<clears throat> this is the kind of thing that, that invites attention. So I like to say when wildfire walks, money talks. So this kind of a uh, relationship I think is important to identify and definitely has the ears of policymakers and people are making decisions about how funding is allocated towards natural resource management. And finally, um, like Kevin mentioned, my personal opinion, the future of keeping fire on our side is also in the next generation's hands. That is certainly something that we need to take into consideration in all of these discussions and something that, um, that I work very hard to ensure with my students. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Did we have any questions from the folks on video or us or called in? Um, let's see. Doesn't seem like. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions from the field right now? Yes. Yeah. Well, Silver acres burned by land on the site. Mm -hmm. That includes site prep burning with all that children bubble. So the question was Oh, that thing on the desk? Okay. I'm gonna talk to the machine. Uh, the question was when I showed the acreage burned by ownership type. By ownership type, did that include site prep burn or not? And it did not include site prep burn. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, Lena, um, on your slide you showed uh, the four metrics, including cost and, and uh, uh, resources needed for suppression, mm -hmm. uh, whether it was burned or not burned. If you actually added the, the somewhat or definitely reduced, and you added the that uh, somewhat increase or definitely increase mm -hmm. the the increase cost is higher. I think when you added those two bars together versus the top two bars, mm -hmm. and so uh, I was kind of uh, it really runs counter to the whole argument uh, that if you do the prescribed burning, it's going to reduce your severity and going to reduce your suppression costs, right, et, et cetera. Yeah, I, I think that there there was a slight, that's, oh, so were people able to hear that question? Okay. Um, so the question was in in the reporting of uh, prescribed fire effects on wildfire suppression resources, it looked like if you added up sort of the negative and the positive, that there was a little bit more saying that there was an increase in costs versus a decrease. Um, so I have to take a scientist approach here. So there weren't actually significant differences okay. between those two, but we that's a great thing that you caught that detail. Um, we also looked at that and thought that that was curious. Um, again, you know, we thought that it was exceptional that there weren't, that everybody wasn't saying there was a major decrease. Yeah. Um, and, you know, given the amount of experience in the, the, the body of respondents that we have, um, I think we have to recognize that that's really what they think. Yeah. Okay. And are you is Reggie going to talk about the whole cost issue yes. and farm bill programs and stuff like that? Exactly. Okay. Last one last question then we can take some later on. Yes, sir. Did the when you when you were talking about private commercial and private non commercial, uh -huh. how did y'all include the, the team of these? That was considered private commercial. Okay. Mm -hmm. And 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 it, it, all of the respondents self-identified. Okay. Yeah. Last question. Alan. Not really a question here, but I, I like really where you started out talking about the, what really is the liability issue for some of these folks and talk about kind of peeling that onion and find out what that's really all about. It's different for different sets of landowners and uh, when you get lawyers and sometimes juries Mm -hmm. involved in interpreting the protection of the law and we got a family over here that's had family members killed and on a wreck on the highway and you, 
you know, liability is different from, from the glass that you're wearing, you know, wherever your <coughs> wherever your perspective is. And mm -hmm. that, that would be a really good session to <coughs> get some folks on both sides of that issue and, and see what could be mitigated from both ends. I, I don't know that us government folks really understand the liability being both the same on yeah, I, I absolutely agree, and I know, Alan, with the experience that you've had as State Forester in Georgia, that you've probably seen every every aspect of, of that <coughs> issue. Um, it's definitely a ripe area for investigation. It is. Yeah. And in fact, I mean, in my personal experience, when I saw those results, I just started asking every private landowner I met. Um, and oftentimes, the, the private commercial landowners refer to a risk assessment. That a risk assessment showed that X, Y, and Z, that it would be not worthwhile taking taking the risk. Um, and I've asked where those risk assessments are, um, and nobody seems to, to have that data sort of available. So I'm not sure if it's more of a, a culture or if it's based on data. That's something that I think is worthy of investigation, and I'm sure a lot of you can provide information about that as well. Another, another thing that I picked up from this is as a communicator, when somebody says prescribed fire can increase the potential for wildfire, you know, the hairs on the back of your neck kind of stand up and go, wow, how are we going to message this one now? Right. Yeah. That, that may be something that we need to chat about as we, as we work through this group. Thank you so very much. It was a great presentation.